Summit on the Gender-Based Violence and Femicide. Today, today we represent an Um, today we represent an important uh, today represent an important milestone in the struggle against gender-based violence and femicide. As you are well all aware, the establishment of the interim steering committee on gender-based violence and femicide is in Article Three of the Declaration of the Presidential Summit on Gender-Based Violence and femicide. The interim steering committee was tasked with the responsibility of implementing actions and declarations and establishing a permanent national multi-sectoral body that which, among other responsibilities, develop national strategic plan and gender-based violence and femicide for the country. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the interim steering committee who did not wait for the resources for the gender-based violence and femicide uh, council to be established, but took it upon themselves to develop the national steering, uh, national strategic plan, and which was approved by cabinet and today being, the, uh, being presented to its rightful champion, His Excellency, the President uh, Ramaphosa. The Interim Steering Committee took us back to the basics where government, civil society, organizations, and development partners came together to develop a plan that seeks to eradicate the gender-based violence in our country. While the interim steering committee was busy with the development of the national strategic plan and national consultation, we saw unprecedented escalation of reported cases of gender-based violence and femicide and led to the president calling for a joint sitting of parliament to discuss, of different political parties to discuss the sketch. Subsequently, the interim strategic committee developed the ERAP, the emergency response plan that they have been monitoring and providing support and rapid response to survivors at community uh, level. As the interim committee uh, was preparing to submit the national strategy plan, another crisis befell us of global magnitude, COVID-19. Even though their task was done, they showed leadership again and in, in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. We have seen global trends and indicated that gender-based violence has increased during the lockdown. Honorable President and distinguished members, in order to, for the country to intervene in the other strategies, in particular in this strategy, to address gender-based violence even within COVID, the interim steering committee has, the develop, has developed the emergency pathways for referrals and guidelines, which has subs and uh, send it to their provincial structures and, they, and, 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 and have them supported the teams working with the different work systems for COVID-19. I also would like to thank is the German uh, corporation who has ensured that there is a continuity by extending the period of the Secretariat until uh, August and the United Nations 
women and the technical person who will also support the work of the IMC, the International Committee of the President, to ensure that we do not fail this nation. In conclusion, we, will, we thank you uh, very much for the sterling job you have done. Now the Interministerial Committee was appointed by the, uh, the president and already met with, and they will urgently ensure that it appoints the permanent structure uh, being the gender-based violence and femicide council that must implement the national strategic plan. We look forward to working together with you, with you all of you, as we address the impact of COVID-19 on gender equality, women's empowerment forward. I thank you. May I now call um, Professor Olive Sushan uh, to speak to us? Okay. Okay. Are we? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me start by saying that thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Thank you very much, um, the, min the minister and all other ministers that are online, as well as our development partners. I won't take a lot of time, um, you know, doing the introductions and all of that. What I want to start by saying is that we have seen very high levels of gender-based violence, which have inundated daily you know, our lives through the media. There were so many police reports of the horrific and senseless murder, rape and maiming of women and children in homes and communities. There is a culture of violence and intolerance in our society that manifests itself throughout, whether it's in the home, workplaces, places of worship, neighborhoods, whatsoever. And it doesn't care whether it is class-based or race-based or geographical location-based, gender-based violence, it's all over. It affects everyone. As a reaction to this, our country has decided, to, our country people have decided to, to go to the streets. There were women and children and men. They all went to the streets by thousands so that they would go out and actually protest against what was happening and demanded of the state to ensure that they deal with gender-based violence as an emergency. Last year, we saw the spike you know, in media interest on gender-based violence. And essentially people really raised public awareness and outrage at violence against women. That outrage, they demanded that government and society must really look at this issue as a crisis, acknowledge that what has been done has not been adequate, and then mm -hmm. that uh, they, there must be a response to deal with gender-based violence. The next slide, please. What I'm going to do in terms of the progress report, I'm gonna to try to touch on five things. One is the access to justice for victims and survivors. The second one is changing norms and behavior through high level prevention efforts. The third one is really the question of, uh, I think it's a wrong presentation you're putting. Can you just please put the presentation related to my, my uh, speech, please? This one is on the national strategic plan that you have put in. There are two presentations. One is on the national strategic plan, and the other one is a presentation on. Uh, it's a presentation related to what I'm supposed to 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 tell you. Can you please change? I'm struggling here. I can't see. The screen is gone. Can you please remove this presentation? I'm not sure if you can hear me. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna, I was, talk, I was gonna touch basis on access to justice, changing the norms in terms of prevention, responding to victims and survivors of gender-based violence, and then strengthening accountability and architecture, and then prioritizing interventions that focus on economic opportunities for women 
And then I'll end with the conclusions and uh, lesson learned. Can I get the next uh, slide, please? Okay. The next slide says access to justice for victims and survivors. We are aware of the massive challenges with the responsiveness of the justice system. That is a criticism that we had across the country. Consequently, the report has focused on improving capacity to investigate and prosecute sexual offenses and prioritized uh, gender-based violence, which was very, very good. Secondly, we developed the human resource plan for family violence and child abuse and sexual offenses capability. And when I say we, I'm talking about government working together with civil society as well as development partners. We develop and enhance the FLS system to track the processing of gender-based violence related cases that allowed for automatic weekly reporting, which was something that was not done before. And in addition to that, we succeeded in terms of access to justice by making available evidence collection kits at police station, that is for adult sexual assault, for pediatric sexual assault, as well as DNA referencing. We also succeeded as a country to have the family violence and child abuse and sexual offenses units strengthened with about 312 policemen who were trained uh, to deal with uh, gender-based violence. Furthermore, on the question of access to justice, the cold case task team was established on the 1st of October, 2019. And believe it or not, it has since analyzed more than 700,000 dockets related to sexual offenses. That tells you how serious a problem this is in the country. The NPA has also commenced with addressing the long outstanding sexual offenses. Of course, this is done in a phased approach. We also, as a country, have ensured that we've got the multifunctional teams. They've been established and they are working with selected courts to create a victim-centric centric justice system in targeted provinces. There are three laws that uh, have been prepared by the Department of Justice. That is the criminal law. Uh, that is a sexual offenses and related matters amendment bill. It has been prepared. The domestic violence bill has also been prepared and the criminal matters amendment bill also has been prepared. And this deals with the question of bail and sentencing. And it is being consulted. Today is the last day you know, for consultation. Coming now to the question of changing norms in terms of prevention. We understand that patriarchal system moves attitudes and masculine practices of young men and boys. Essentially what it does, it encourages domineering behavior towards women as men prove their manhood, essentially by committing violence against women. So what it is that we've done? Well, we, we have introduced mass media campaigns which are targeting the public domains that also focus on men's groups and formation. It also focuses on offenders in prison and the youth at risk. We have commenced with the gender-based violence sensitivity training, which is targeting the law enforcement officials, the prosecutors, the magistrates, the policymakers, as well as media houses. We are fortunate in the sense that the Department of Higher Education has put a lot of resources on higher health, and they have been able to engage to drive behavioral change in institutions of higher uh, learning, as well as further education. The government launched the 365 days sustained campaign to prevent and condemn gender-based violence in partnership with First for Women and the UN sustained media engagement through the social media and public awareness on gender-based violence overall. There were other interventions that were done like, you know, the Voku Zenzela publications, which was done by GCIS to raise awareness on the agency to end gender-based violence. Other initiatives were the three men's campaign, the comprehensive sexuality education, the March Against Gender-Based Violence, which was led by uh, public service and administration, as well as uh, some of the initiatives on women in media dialogue, which posted uh, quite a lot of posters and had numerous print and broadcast media promotions. Coming now to the question of uh, responding to victims and survivors of gender-based violence. We all recognize that survivors of gender-based violence have continu continued to face a secondary trauma, which essentially prevents them to have access to necessary support and justice. This, of course, is an additional violation of their human dignity. To this end, we succeeded as government and civil society and development partners 
to have a complete resource audit of the existing Tutuzela care centers in five provinces. So we also ensure that we look at all of these places to see how adequately equipped are they to be able to address the problems that we're facing. So the audit that it offered also the pre-exposure prophylaxis so that those people who are violated sexually can be able to prevent HIV. And we did so in order to determine the correct baseline to ensure that the provision is available in all of the facilities to meet the requirements when required. And then also uh, more than nine buildings were identified as uh, additional shelters. Still on the question of responding to victims and survivors of gender-based violence, we have ensured that in the Tutuzela centers, we are upgrading them with their five, five new Tutuzela care centers. The sites are in the Eastern Cape, Free State, uh, Gauteng, KwaZulu Natal, uh, Limpopo and Northwest, as well as the, the Western Cape. And the other initiative that we implemented with the assistance of the United Nations was the question of the rapid result initiative. And this initiative was helping us to say within 100 days, what is it that you can do? So you focus your work on a daily basis to see what it is that you can achieve. We piloted that as a potential vehicle through which to build an expanded response to gender-based violence. On the fourth point I wanted to mention is strengthening accountability architecture to respond to the scourge of gender-based violence. We are aware of the uncoordinated and fragmented way that the key role players and stakeholders who implement gender-based violence and programs and intervention, this has undermined the response to gender-based violence in the country. So it was necessary to strengthen accountability. We're very happy that the president, the cabinet and parliament have individually and collectively committed themselves to work alongside all sectors of society to address this particular social challenge. The government has agreed on a multi-sectoral model. They bought into it. Civil society has also called for a holistic inter-organizational and inter-agency cooperation and collaboration to ensure that there is active participation by all those who are affected by gender-based violence. We are happy with what the minister has already indicated that the structure of the gender-based violence has already been approved by cabinet and also that the draft gender-based violence council bill has been prepared because it's got to be a legal entity in the long run. And also you heard that there is already an interministerial committee. Now on the fifth point, which I'm coming closer to the end, is really prioritizing interventions that facilitate economic opportunities. Here is where we did not do as much work as we had planned to do. But because we understand clearly that the extremely high levels of social and economic inequality is a driver of gender-based violence, and it requires immediate attention as part of a sustainable approach to the prevention of gender-based violence in our country. So we started with two initiatives. One was the Economic Opportunities, which was initiated for women within the Sanitary Dignitary Program. Uh, there we looked at the value chain within the manufacturing, the purchasing, the sourcing, storage, and distribution, packaging, and disposal, as well as waste management, to see where women can fit in you know, within this particular uh, value chain. We also ensured that uh, we contracted 319 participants uh, from other areas in order to deal with gender-based violence in the eight provinces. In conclusion, I want to say that um, we have prioritized and improved capacity to investigate and prosecute cases of sexual violence. We have heightened national multifaceted and media campaign to prevent gender-based violence through norms and behavior change. We have increased human resource capacity and provision of infrastructure so we can urgently address the question of gender-based violence. We have introduced and piloted innovative interventions that are evidence-based to improve effectiveness and quality of services provided. We have increased accountability through provisioning of strong political leadership, commitment of, substantive, of substantial state resources and reporting. We have introduced a range of legal and regulatory reforms in the legislature to strengthen the state's response to gender-based violence. We have introduced interventions to facilitate economic opportunities for addressing women's economic vulnerability. And lastly, we have enhanced and strengthened partnership. Thank you very much. Committee, Advocate Brenda Madumizi, 
stage is yours. Remember? Is Brenda with us? Yes, I'm here, but you need to unmute me. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Good, good afternoon, Mr. President, uh, ministers, and my fellow colleagues uh, from the steering committee and any other participant on this important uh, meeting this afternoon. And I, I want to start with this, Mr. President, and say, you, say this to you. And the question will be asked, why is it a big issue that we are handing over a national strategic plan on gender-based violence to UN? Why is it a big deal? It is a big deal for, them, for the many reasons. Mm -hmm. In that for the last 15 years, South Africans and South African women in particular have been making, been making the case for an, a coordinated approach in how we address gender-based violence and femicide in this country. We have had stop and start for many years. And that was driven largely by political will and political leadership, right? Depending on who the minister is in the Department of Women or who the leader is leading the country, we found ourselves not gaining traction or even making headway in gender-based violence precisely because there was no political will. So, Mr. President, we are grateful that you took charge and you, you were bold enough and had the courage to hear what we had to say about gender-based violence and literally agreed to have a summit. That summit led to a declaration. And here we are today in 2020, April the 30th, handing over a document that I think we can all be proud of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a document that is, is, finds expression on, on a number of levels. But let me center it, and I'm not going to follow the presentation because I want to speak from the heart. This document will could remember a young woman who died after giving birth who was part of the shutdown. Mm -hmm. Sorry. At the center of this document, Mr. President, is prevention. Mm. We can't continue to lose women mm. because patriarchy and our standing as men in this country dictates and allows us to do so. So when you read the NSP, Mr. President, is that it is it finds expression on prevention. We need to pull all our resources on prevention. Mm. And once we, 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 have, we pull those resources on prevention, it's easier to deal with law and policy reforms, to deal with care and support, to deal with research, to deal with economic empowerment or economic power, precisely because almost all of us, the 58 million South Africans, understand why it's important to read this society of violence, right? Especially to, the, to women and children in this country. Secondly, Mr. President is, and you, you would have seen in the document that is before you on the era, that we, we forced collaboration, coordination at all costs. So that this is not seen as a women's problem or a particular ministry's problem, but it is across all the departments in government that they understand what needs to be done to ensure that we read this country of gender-based violence. And then you draw in civil society to ensure that they also pull in the same direction as we all pulling. Why is this NSP important? It's for the simple reason that will all of us, the 58 million South Africans who are going to be speaking from one hymn book. We are not going to be fragmented any longer. We are not going to be sending different messages. We are going to be consistent 
and constant in the messaging that we give to South Africa on gender-based violence, right? So Mr. President, as you address and you are dealing with the COVID-19, is it's that gender-based violence is forms part of every single work that has been done by the teams that you have. We will continue in the work that we, we do as respective NGOs to support this work that is being put that has been pulled in the in, within the national strategic plan. It has six pillars, Mr. President, and those six pillars talk to each other. They are not, they're not separate, they're interlinked and intertwined, right? And all that we are saying as, as, as this steering committee, as we hand it over, is that what we're looking for, and under your leadership and your stewardship, is that you are going to foster this collaboration and coordination that we tried to, to start with, right? So that we do not, we don't, we are not found, we are not found faltering in the execution of this national strategic plan. There is going to be a permanent structure, right? And we decided on a lean and mean structure because we didn't want the resources that must go towards the programs and the interventions themselves to be sucked into a huge structure. So we, we, we proposed a lean and mean structure. You will see it's made up of 13 individuals um, and, and that takes a um, cue from the declaration where the declaration specifically provided for 51% of the, the members of the council should be coming from civil society. So of the 13 members, you will have seven of those coming from civil society and six from government. And I think it's, it, the six is made up of the interministerial com, uh, committee that, we, that is been spoken about, right? Mr. President, I need to emphasize this. For this to be a reality for the many, is that the resources must be made available. The costing was done for this NSP. The figure given and that we worked on, we're looking at 8 billion to fund the entire execution and implementation of the National Strategic Plan, right? Those resources must be made available so that a year, two years, three years down the line, we are not back here again, or we don't have South African women being on the streets demanding answers again, right? So it's important that once this document, has, it has been approved by cabinet, that we understand what it means when we say it's been approved. It means then that it must start to be implemented, not yesterday, but as from tomorrow, that almost every government department sits with this program, with the NSP and understand how it should be implemented. And we are asking for speed in, the, in its implementation. We cannot afford to sit back and put stumbling blocks on why the NSP cannot be, cannot be implemented. So for, for me, it's, 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 it's that it, it has been a journey that was worth it, that we can give to government a blueprint on how we as South Africans, the 58 million of us, because we are looking for a collaborative approach, multi-sectoral approach, that all of us, the 58 million, have got a stake in shaping the future of this country and making sure that women's equality is, is recognized and it's, 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 it's a lived experience. We just don't say these things for the sake of saying them, right? So prevention, Mr. President, execution and accountability. Those are key to this work. And we would like to ensure that as, as, as we, we, hand it, and we hand over this national strategy plan, that you, 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 you are, as, as you, you, you lead the team, you appreciate and you, you keep on saying to them, this document, is about execution, 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 right? And that we do not have the luxury of time as South African women, as South African citizens, to sit back and not implement what we have worked on uh, tirelessly for the two years that we, we have done this work. So in, in closing, Mr. President, 
I need to say this, as Minister Ngwane Mashabane said earlier, we did not wait for resources to be made available by government to do this work. This work was made possible by the sheer passion and drive of the many women in that steering committee and found resources from Lotto, from Ford Foundation, uh, from UNFPA, from UN Women, from Department of Women, from Social Development, who, when we went out to do the consultations, resources were made available for those consultations to be a reality. We engaged extensively with multitude of South African women in shaping this document. So be rest assured, Mr. President, this document is, has got the fingerprints of every single South African man and woman who participated in the consultation process. So, Mr. President, finally, I want to thank the team that worked with us in producing this document and, and understanding the, the magnitude and appreciating the work that uh, uh, at hand and ensuring that today we can confidently hand in this, this document. And I must say this, Mr. President, we were ready in October because we did hand, we, we finished this work around October, November, and, um, and we stayed true to what we had undertaken and promised to South Africa that we will, will give a national strategic document by that time. So thank you very much for the, for the leadership that came from the office of the president. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that the team that is coming in to, to then take this bait and drive the implementation of the, of the national strategic plan will do exactly that, emulate the kind of spirit that, that we saw during this process of, of the Interim Steering Committee. Thank you very much. implementation and more implementation. Are we muted? Are we on? We're fine now. Okay. Yeah. Next, uh, <coughs> without much ado, would be Mrs. N. Chituku uh, Nshongwe, representing all UN interagency uh, gender group here in South Africa. And Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Maite, for your introduction. Good afternoon, Your Excellency, the President, um, Cyril Ramaphosa. I also want to recognize the uh, Minister in the Presidency responsible for women, youth, and persons with disabilities with whom we have worked very closely over this entire period. I want to recognize Deputy Minister, Professor Shengiwe Mkize as well, with whom we have work, worked very closely. Um, I want to recognize the ministers who are here present as well. The co-chairs of the Interim Council for Gender-Based Violence and Femicide, both Professor Olive Shisana and Advocate Brenda Madumise, who have led with excellence, Your Excellency. Mm -hmm. They have demonstrated a model of leadership that as the United Nations, we have recognized as a first. And we really look forward to seeing this um, as we move forward in the Gender-Based Violence Council, a true partnership between government and civil society. We want to recognize also all the members of the Interim Steering Committee who have worked tirelessly to make um, this work happen. <clears throat> and my fellow development partners whom I represent, um, the United Nations that I represent as the chair of the inter, uh, interagency gender theme group, but also um, the GIZ, the EU, the US government, um, Irish aid, all of whom have contributed financially and technically to this process. And I just want to recognize them here. Um, as development partners, we acknowledge the unparalleled leadership that your excellency has exhibited. Your name is now well known across the world and in Africa, it is now, you're now celebrated as a champion for gender-based violence and femicide because of the work that we have seen here in South Africa. And we look forward to seeing your continued leadership in this space including at the African Union. We uh, would like to really commend the continuing work and relationship of this interim uh, steering committee and congratulate them for the hard work that has taken place in this emergency response and action plan, but also in the national strategic plan. 
this emergency response action plan, uh, there's a lot of work that still needs to happen, but there are some key areas that you heard from Dr. Professor Shisana that we believe um, are beginning to show some signs of real change across um, the country. And we want to recognize that many of your government uh, um, ministers and leaders opened their, their offices and they opened themselves to quite tough criticism. Um, the justice system began to look very seriously at how to improve its rapid um, its results and looking at uh, uh, um, how to speed up the processes there. We had a comprehensive review of the police and um, the, the challenges that, that exist within the police in terms of their responsiveness. Um, some of that work, I think, was presented by, by Professor Shisana. But we also, um, following your leadership of the, uh, the district method, the district uh, models, we, we started to do and support work bringing in technical, global technical support on rapid results. Um, and it's a process that is still underway, both in justice, but also uh, in the Eastern Cape right now. And we have teams of over 60 people who have been engaged until this uh, lockdown period, who've been actively engaged in trying to ensure that they've got high levels of efficiency and effectiveness and responsiveness to gender-based violence. The National Strategic Plan is now completed and we are very, very proud as the UN um, that it is very well aligned to the comprehensive essential services package that serves as a global minimum standard for prevention and response to ending violence against women and girls. And we would continue to work with the National Strategic Plan in supporting this process to ensure that those standards um, are held up and that we are able to share whatever technical guidance we can. We recognize that this national strategic plan not only talks about women, but about girls, about children, about women in all their diversity, including those persons with disabilities, but also gender non-conforming uh, persons uh, and victims of human trafficking, women who, 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 who are, are, are taking drugs and, and other forms who are really furthest left behind in all parts of the country. We also want to recognize right now, um, uh, Your Excellency, that GBV is a big uh, issue during the corona period and that in fact we are calling it the shadow epidemic. And so while the world is grappling with um, health issues and working with, uh, grappling with socioeconomic issues, the United Nations has identified violence against women and children as a shadow pandemic. As the pandemic grows, violence against women grows. And even though we have heard that data is pointing to a reduction, we know that there has been reduction, particularly in public spaces, and we, we are happy to hear that. But we also know that a key fe feature of gender-based violence during this COVID, COVID period is under-reporting because of proximity to their partners. As you know, intimate partner violence is the highest level of violence even in this country and across the world. 203 million women experience intimate partner violence on, a, on an annual basis. Um, and in normal context, most women walk to the police stations and walk to clinics rather than uh, use um, um, you know, online reporting. And so we want to recognize that even though there have been some marginal increases um, through the call centers, that we know that there has been under-reporting. And it is crucial, um, Your Excellency, that during this time, all support services to victims of gender-based violence are highlighted as critical essential services and I invested in and that there is significant, a significant attention to these essential services as we are giving to food, to water and to health because we find that these are easily forgotten. Your Excellencies, Ministers here present, Co-Chairs and all the partners with whom we have walked this journey and have had the privilege to serve. We want to commend and, uh, uh, your excellent work and we want to say from us as development partners, we will continue to lend our unwavering support to the uh, Interim Ministerial Committee and to the new Gender-Based Violence and Femicide Council. It has been a privilege to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam and Chetou. Um, it's not done until it's done. We have just begun a very difficult journey and we know we know we sure we will succeed with you. It is now my honor and privilege 
to hand over this to one and only president of the Republic of South Africa and the partner that we can rely on when it's rainy and when it's shiny. Over to you, Mr. President. Well, thank you, uh, Minister Maite Nkwana Mashabani, the Minister of Women, Youth, and Persons with uh, Disabilities. I greet you and I greet all the other ministers who are part of this uh, occasion and deputy ministers. I also want to extend my greetings to the co-chairs of uh, the Interim Steering Committee on Gender-Based Violence and Femicide, Professor Olive Shisana, as well as my sister Brenda Madumise Pajibo, but also to the members of the Interim Steering Committee, not forgetting our friends in the development community, various NGOs, and of course, uh, my sister from the UN Women. And members of the media, of course. Today we are marking three milestones, very key critical milestones in our nation's struggle to end gender-based violence against women and children. Firstly, we are marking the completion of the work of the Interim Steering Committee on gender-based violence and femicide, I must say, truly excellent work that this Interim Steering Committee was able to execute. Much as they were an Interim Steering Committee, they pulled out all stops, they excelled, and worked day in and day out. And sometimes when people are put on interim structures, they tend to be very interim and uh, very tentative uh, and very uncertain in executing their tasks. But I must say this interim steering committee really folded their sleeves and got down to doing real meaningful work to advance the cause of women in our country against gender-based violence. We set this interim committee up in the wake of the 2018 Presidential Summit on Gender-Based Violence. Secondly, the other milestone is the committee today is handing over the six-month progress report of the emergency response action plan, but we are also releasing, and this report is being handed over to me, the long-awaited National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence, which was one of the key decisions of the Presidential Summit that was held in 2018. Now, earlier this week, we commemorated one of the most important days in our calendar, our Freedom Day, where we reaffirmed our commitment to our constitution as a country to the framework that we set out to craft in 1994, in which is embedded the rights of all our people but more importantly, also the rights of women and children that are fundamentally tied to our sense of nationhood. South Africa, as many of us know, is one of the most unsafe places in the world to be a woman. Gender-based violence impacts black and white, young and old, rich and poor, heterosexual, 
and people with diverse sexual orientation, gender conforming or non-gender conforming, urban or rural. The protests that we were all witness to that took place last year in response to a series of what one would call high profile incidents of rape and murder of women and girls were in many ways a clarion call from the women of our country through their various formations, women's movement, and all of society that more needs to be done to combat the scourge of gender-based violence. As we recall, the women of our country made a clear call to the whole nation that something serious and drastic needs to be done to bring an end to gender-based violence in South Africa. And these were cries of frustration and anger that despite our progressive laws, we as a country had failed to protect the women of our country and the girls of our country from abuse, ill treatment and femicide. It gave us a reality check. It was clear at the time that a coherent and more measurable strategy to deal with this growing problem was sorely needed. And at exactly the same time, we found that a number of other countries were dealing with the same type of problem. France, Spain, Cote d'Ivoire, and a number of other countries on our continent. And it therefore called on us that we needed to do something. Now, given the magnitude of the problem, it was clear that it needed to receive the very highest degree of attention. For this reason, I decided to locate the work of the interim steering committee that was set up at the summit in the office of the president. And in fact, the women of our country felt that to demonstrate that we were giving it serious attention, it needed to be located at the highest office in the land. And it was for that reason that I was quite pleased that it should be located in the president's office. Now, I was pleased that the committee comprised government, civil society, development partners, researchers, and scientists. It was a diverse type of committee. And it had the strength of being able to be a committee that would come up with a lot of good ideas. And each of the partners brought their unique perspective on how to address and overcome the problem of gender-based violence. And that was the richness of the composition of that committee. Everyone on the committee had valuable ideas on a whole range of aspects of this problem, on prevention, on the care of survivors, on ensuring that there is justice and accountability, and others also focus more closely on the one aspect that is so important, the economic empowerment of women and young girls. The committee took great care to ensure that all strategies, as well as all plans and coordinating mechanisms, were developed, were put in place, and were done so in a transparent and accountable manner. It, I was provided with uh, regular reports on a weekly basis on the work that was being done by this committee. 
And that to me gave me an opportunity to keep pace with the work. Now, guided by the presidential summit, the committee went beyond identifying interventions to address gender-based violence and femicide to consider the wider challenges women and children face with regards to safety and security, but also poverty and access to economic opportunities. They also looked at the contestation around the rights of women and children in a climate where patriarchy and chauvinism is widely prevalent in our country. Now the emergency response action plan was born out of the need to come up with an urgent plan to deal with gender-based violence cases in the middle of 2019. The plan focused on four key interventions. Broadening access to justice for survivors of violence. Secondly, changing social norms and behavior. And thirdly, strengthening the existing architecture and also promoting accountability. And lastly, the creation of more economic opportunities for women. Among other things, the plan owes its success to the buy-in of all political parties in our parliament who pledge their support following the joint sitting of parliament that I convened last year at the height of the challenges that we were facing. Now, government departments rallied around the plan and we were able to source around 1.6 billion rand through budget reprioritization. And this for me was a very positive development because we found fertile ground in government departments where government department leaders in the form of ministers, directors general, and other key officials were very positively disposed to what needed to be done. They saw this as a national emergency that we needed to address the scourge. On access to justice, government budget prioritization allowed resources to be redirected to supporting the network of sexual offenses courts. The Tutuzela Care Centers and the South African Police Service Family Violence and Child Protection and Sexual Investigation Units. Systems to track the processing of gender-based violence cases, the rollout of a rapid results method in courts, and the establishment of the cold case task team, where we are able to follow up on cases that had gone cold, that had been, you know, discarded or just ignored. We were able also to focus on issues such as evidence, collection kits, and how these should be made available at all police stations. On the part of the prevention effort, mass media campaigns have been rolled out nationwide and spearheaded by the government communications information system. I will be the first to admit that much more needs to be done in this regard to increase our efforts on prevention. And as my sister Brenda Madumise Pajibo said, this is an area that we need to focus more attention on so that we are able to prevent acts of violence against women and children. Our interventions targeted law enforcement as well and judicial officers as well as specific gender-based violence awareness campaigns targeting men's forums or for formations also targeting offenders themselves and youth at risk, as well as 
tertiary institutions. With regards to response, care, and support for the survivors of gender-based violence, the number of Tutuzela care centers have had to increase have had to be increased and they are being increased as we speak now. Now, I want to see more and more of these centers being spread out in the country. I'm frankly not happy even with the number that has been pegged at 100 by 2025. I want to see more of these centers throughout the length and the breadth of our country being there ready to serve as refuge for the women of our country who need to have a place of refuge. A number of government buildings have also been identified and have been handed over to the Department of Social Welfare, Social Development rather, to be used as additional shelters. So this is progress. It is unfortunate that progress has been slow in opening up economic opportunities for women and addressing the scale of gendered poverty. I'm hoping, though, that in this regard, past COVID-19, as we migrate into an economy which I would like to see as transformed, reformed as a new economy, we will be able to empower the women of our country much more strongly than we do now and offer the women of South Africa and the young women of our country more economic opportunities. This is an area that requires far greater attention, especially as we work to mitigate the economic and social impact of this coronavirus. We must support women's empowerment through preferential procurement, funding of women-owned small and medium enterprises, and also speeding up women's access to land. Among other things, South Africa will seek to leverage our chairship of the African Union and our participation in a number of other regional and continental and international bodies to promote women's financial inclusion and support. Our application to join the UN Action Coalition on Economic Justice earlier this year is an example of the ways in which we can contribute to and benefit from the global women's economic empowerment agenda. Now, the greatest achievement of the Emergency Response Action Plan is that it fundamentally changed how government departments involved in gender sector interacted and collaborated. The implementation of the action plan enabled government processes that ordinarily are fraught with red tape to be fast-tracked. It inculcated a much smarter approach to using and managing resources because government departments had to stretch their apportioned budgets to meet ambitious targets. From the outset, it was clear that this would be a short-term plan to be implemented over six months. We have reached the end of that six months term and the consolidated report being presented today covers those six months. Now the emergency plan helped in a number of ways to set up a delivery mechanism for a longer set of interventions and the work will now be taken over by the Gender-Based Violence and Femicide Council. The Council will also oversee the implementation of the National Strategic Plan, which is being launched today and being handed over to me. Now, this plan is government and civil society's framework to realize 
a South Africa free from gender-based violence and femicide. It is a framework that will enable us to make the correct and the right interventions. It recognizes all violence against women across age, location, disability, sexual orientation, sexual and gender identity, nationality, and other diversities, as well as violence against children. The NSP, as we call this plan, is premised on the equality of all gender groupings, including the LGBTQI plus community, and affirms that accessing services is human rights based. We will galvanize support for this plan by creating a permanent structure to steer its implementation and budgeting for over the medium term plan that we framework that we have. Let us congratulate the interim steering committee for their sterling efforts in getting us to this point. They have worked tirelessly, as I said, crisscrossing the country to engage with stakeholders as we had and uh, to support the efficient implementation of the plan. I know for a fact that some of the committee members literally drove from place to place, from police station to police station around the country to ensure, for instance, that the much needed evidence testing kits were delivered. And they knew in almost a microscopic way which police stations were lacking in these tests and they kept raising it to a point where the Minister of Police finally had to give me a report and say, Mr. President, we now have these testing kits in all our police stations. And this was given rise to by the members of the steering committee who committed themselves to ensuring that these evidence test kits were made available in all our police stations. They are truly to be applauded because they went beyond the call of duty to make sure that this is done. This is but one example of the enthusiasm with which they did their job. Let me also thank all partners in the development community, in business, in the labor movement, in community-based organizations, as well as political parties, various formations of women in various political parties, and across many sectors for the great contributions that they have also made in this effort. In this year, which, we, which marks the end of the decade of African women, 2010 to 2020, and the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the Beijing Declaration, and platform for action, we remain unequivocally committed to the cause of advancing the rights of women and making sure that their rights that are constitutional are upheld. I hope that the finalization of the emergency response action plan process actually heralds a start of a new and intensified effort in our country to combat gender-based violence and that many more milestones will be reached. Now, the coronavirus pandemic heightens the risk of gender-based violence as women may be experiencing emotional and physical abuse behind the walls of their homes. This calls for heightened responsiveness greater awareness and practical measures that need to be taken to assist women who find themselves in vulnerable situations as we speak during this lockdown period. Now, as the country enters level four of our coronavirus response from tomorrow, the 1st of May, we have determined that persons providing services to gender-based violence survivors are among those who are permitted 
to do their work and to move around. As with all people returning to work, they would need to adhere to strict health protocols and social distancing rules. We have made much progress, but there is still much, much, much more that needs to be done. And I would that we continue with our work to realize a South Africa that is free from violence and that embraces the promise of the human rights for all. But more especially, a South Africa that respects the rights of women, that upholds the rights of women, that also up applauds the role that the women of our country play in the development of our country as a whole. And with this, I'd like to thank you and I'd like to applaud all those who've been involved in this effort. This is definitely a great development in our country today. Thank you. Really, thank you, thank you, thank you ever so much. And we are assured that we do have a partner we can trust and we can continue moving on with. Without much ado, because you had only borrowed us one hour, can I request uh, Professor Mkise, uh, my deputy, to just say a word or two in thanking um, the president and uh, the delegation because I don't know how she's going to do it in one minute, but I know she can, so that we continue working and working. Okay, thank, thank you, Minister, uh, for unmuting me or allowing the administrators to unmute me. Um, firstly, I must greet the, His Excellency, President uh, Mr. President uh, Ramaphosa, we really appreciate being with you today. It's a great honor for us. Uh, Minister Maite Kwane Mashabane, uh, thank you for the leadership you have provided in ensuring that uh, our, members of, uh, our, our members of staff continue to support the work of the National Steering Committee. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Dr. Olive Shisana and Advocate Brenda Matumise Hajibo, uh, co-chairs uh, who have worked as the president and all other speakers have said in an amazing manner. The work that they've done will always be remembered as it's going to be a guide in terms of what the gender Based Violence and Femicide Council will be doing. But also for us as government, it has brought back that activism of working in partnership uh, with civil society for greater impact. I would also like to thank uh, Madam N. Dituku Shogwe, the chair of the UN Interagency Gender Groups, and I must say, as she was thanking us and other departments, we thank the UN agencies a, a lot for the cooperation they've shown, the support in assisting us in all our strategic, especially public, um, public events. We hope the relationship will be deepened even more as we talk implementation. Uh, coming to Mr. President, uh, Mr. President, I would like to thank you very much uh, for steering this ship by being the moral authority and the, and the face of the GPVF campaign, as well as providing strong political leadership within parliament uh, and government to ensure that there is a broader uh, day in. Your role in particular started a revolution. We saw young people, we saw men, we saw uh, religious bodies standing up, saying enough is enough, echoing the words of women. 
so we do believe that the success of the gender-based violence and femicide cancer, the success of the department in implementing uh, the, 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 the work of the NSP with a sense of, of agency will depend a lot on the support and the commitments uh, you have made to these women here today. Mr. President, they are just, you know, when talking today uh, with joy, receiving these three documents, this, it's important to just take us back to a memory lane when women said, Sizolalala, as humbly before we see the president. We all were taken aback in terms of saying, is it the right time for the president to step out and listen to women who are talking about gender-based violence? Because at that time, it was like, it's almost impossible to tackle this problem. But we also, they remember, we remember the day of the summit when, Mr. President, you said you listened attentively, even when women were breaking down in tears, were showing you the scars, and that was the commitment at the highest level. You didn't open and left, but you made sure that you absorb and internalize the voices of women. But also, Mr. President, we really appreciate the, doc the, the, the documents that have been presented to us by the coaches, but also the way you led a, a high-level debate in Parliament, uh, making sure that there's a buy-in. And on that day, we saw unity amongst across all political parties. And it's that kind of leadership which gives us a sense of hope that what we'll be doing from now onwards will be a continue, continuity of the battle that has uh, already been won because you have won the hearts and the minds of South Africans. But of course, Mr. President, in thanking you, we will pick up on what the court ch chairs raised, especially Advocate Brenda Matumise Hajibo, the financing of the gender-based violence um, uh, council will be critical as this will be an opportunity for government to work very closely with civil society across the country at a community level, uh, at, at all level and across all sectors. And that the financing of that work will, will help us to uh, assure women of South Africa that we, we have done all this work to ensure that never again will we be talking about horror stories and all the things that we went through, which have already been men mentioned. We thank you, Mr. President. We don't want to take your time for respecting us in the middle of a coronavirus uh, battle as uh, the UN representative, uh, Ms. N. Jituku Shongwe, reminded us we are grateful that the question of gender-based violence and femicide is at the center of all the high-level discussions of the impact of coronavirus in our communities. And all ministers who have contributed, who are still gonna work with us, we thank, you, we thank them very much. Uh, members of the media who helps us to communicate, we, we are grateful for the work that you are doing. Um, Thank you. She's not on mute. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to be in your presence, albeit remotely.
for me it's a real honor to be engaged with all the women of our country in this noble effort, difficult as it may be, to participate with you to ensure that we restore respect, dignity to the women of our country through eliminating the scourge of violence against women and children. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for you. inviting me to your meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. We are done. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.